Good evening and welcome to the uh, Thousand Oaks City Council meeting for tonight, Tuesday, June 8th. We are going to say the Pledge of Allegiance and we will be led by Ivy Schlosser, who is the uh, chair of our Youth Commission. And Ivy, are you graduating this year? Yeah. So uh, this is a senior graduating from Westlake High School. Mm -hmm. And so we will do you the honor of leading us in the pledge. Or you will do us the honor. <laughs> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. We will hear from you later on today during this meeting. Appreciate that. Madam Clerk, would you please do the roll call? Councilmember Adam? Here. Councilmember Jones? Here. Councilmember McNamee? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Here. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Present. Thank you. We are now going to special presentations, and for that, I will go to our city manager, Drew Powers. Thank you so much, Mayor Bill De La Pena. Uh, just a very brief uh, COVID-19 update. Uh, everyone's eyes are focused on uh, June 15th as uh, we begin the long-awaited uh, full reopening process. Um, so uh, work is underway uh, for that. Um, just seven new cases of COVID today, so it shows the uh, real decline uh, in, uh, in the caseload. And that's uh, countered with um, just uh, about 67% of the uh, county's population, 12 and up, that's received uh, a, uh, at least a first dose. So uh, vaccinations uh, are continuing. Um, uh, VenturaCountyRecovers.org is the county's website for more information, and that concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Mr. Powers. That is very good news indeed. We will actually now go next to a proclamation. We're moving the Juneteenth proclamation up because our one of at least one of the recipients has an AP European history class tonight in which my boys are as well. So uh, Marcus, are you there? And Abigail, are you there? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I now have the honor of proclaiming June 19th, 2021 as Juneteenth in the city of Thousand Oaks. And joining us tonight to accept this proclamation here are, as I mentioned, the president of the Black Union Students or Student Union at Westlake High School, Marcus Nordy, and the vice president of the Black Student Union at Westlake High School, Abigail Flamer. June 10th or June 19, 1865 is the date when the last slaves in America were freed in Texas, almost two and a half years after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Today, Juneteenth is the oldest national celebration of the ending of slavery, and it provides an opportunity for us to recommit ourselves to creating a more equitable, accessible, safe, welcoming, and inclusive community for all. I would like to encourage the people of Thousand Oaks to celebrate this day by honoring and reflecting on the significant role that African Americans have played in our history and how African Americans have enriched society through their steadfast commitment to promoting unity and equality. So Marcus and Abigail, thank you for joining us here tonight in, in accepting this proclamation. If you could uh, tell us a little bit about what you are doing as the president and vice president of BSU at Westlake High School. Marcus, yeah, you go first. So, hi, I am Marcus Norte, president of the Black Student Union. And our Black Student, our Black Student Union's main purpose is to create cohesion among Black students, faculty, and staff, and other individuals of different ethnicities at Westlake High School to establish unity. We want to engage ourselves around our campus and our community, demonstrating a positive perspective of Black culture. We aim to build leaders, promote student success, and develop a safe discussion environment for African American students. Um, we have, uh, every time we meet bi-weekly, we discuss various topics such as 
um, like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, racial encounters and good tips to deal with them. We've analyzed systemic racism and we've talked about thoughts on the Confederate flag, like being used in like, um, like on the street, for example. And a few accomplishments we've had are we've raised over $160 from uh, many fundraisers and we've had um, meetings with middle schoolers to talk about topics such as the phrase, I don't see color. And on to Abby to add to our, some of our- Go ahead, Abby. Meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Abigail Flamer. I'm the vice president of the BSU. Um, and I just wanted to add that despite the fact that COVID, um, you know, prevented us from volunteering as much as we would like to um, in the community, we were still able to make a big impact um, in the community um, by inviting uh, students from Thousand Oaks High School and Newbury Park High School to some of our meetings. And we ended up being able to inspire um, the students from TO to, uh, you know, start their own Black Student Union, which I believe is intended to start next year. And I think that the club overall has made a, a, um, a big impact and a big difference to the students on our own campus, um, many of which have told me that this they really enjoyed the club this year and that this was one of the um, first clubs that really appealed to them as a student of color. And so um, I just I'm very excited to see what the future brings for our club and I'm really honored to be here. So thank you. Thank you both very much. It's so wonderful to present this actually to teenagers, uh, high school students. We have not done this before. And thank you, Marcus and Abigail, for taking the lead in making others aware of an, uh, equity and inclusion. And it's on a more personal level, Marcus, um, I remember you, you were little and you were at the same pre preschool as my children and uh, you are growing into this mature young man and so your parents must be really, really proud of you. Um, so that for me on a personal level is really exciting. Thank you, that's awesome. Um, really so uh, again, thank you for spreading the word early on because when you talk about inclusion and equity and diversity, it has to start early on at home with kindness. And uh, I know that the two of you are spreading love and kindness and you're doing even more through the Black Student Union at Westlake High School. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will present a proclamation on behalf of, um, actually for Pride Month, it, June is Pride Month, and we welcome Tess Allen. She's the Executive Director of Diversity Collective Ventura County who is joining us via Zoom tonight. And I would like to present this proclamation to you, Ms. Allen, on behalf of the Thousand Oaks City Council. I hereby proclaim June 2021 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. And with this proclamation, we applaud the strength and the resiliency of those advocating for freedom, equality for the LGBTQ plus community, and affirm our dedication to upholding the rights and dignity of all people. That's how God wants us to do it. Ms. Allen, will you please take a moment to tell us about Diversity Collective and the work that you are doing for Pride Month? Do we have her? First of all, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of Diversity Collective Ventura County. Um, it's a great honor to accept this year's 2021 Pride Proclamation from the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, for many LGBT residents, we celebrate pride 365 days a year. Our pride shows up in the ways we live authentically and in the ways we move through a world that might seek to do us harm and for the folks that aren't ready to be out just yet. We stand on the shoulders of generations of LGBTQ activists past and present as we move, as we move toward creating the worlds that we want to see. At DCVC, our mission is to provide advocacy visibility, safety, and wellness for the LGBTQ community. We invite you to join us in our mission by attending some of our upcoming events. On June 12th, we're having La Zona Rosa, which is our very first time having a Spanish-speaking drop-in uh, resource fair uh, at our community resource center. 
um, and the Mexican consulate will be there um, and uh, we'll have a raffle, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, we might even have a taco truck. <laughs> um, on June 19th, um, we are holding uh, an open house and our roll up your sleeves for pride vaccine uh, mobile clinic uh, where you can come and no appointment and uh, get your vaccines. And then on June 26, we are uh, co-sponsoring and coordinating with Oxnard BLM Pride for their March at Plaza Park in collaboration with the Oxnard LGBTQ uh, BLM VC and Families First and a few others. And please save the date for August 21st for Ventura County Pride. We always do ours in August. If you want more information, you are welcome and please do uh, email us at info at diversity.org. And uh, my ask to our city council and to all Ventura County residents is that we continue to move beyond words and into actions. Being an ally is not just an adjective. It's showing up and being in love, being love in motion. May we continue to show up for one another and may we keep doing the work to make a community that is safe, inclusive, and equitable for all. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Thank you so much. And as an aside, the city of Thousand Oaks actually held its first Pride Festival a couple of years ago here outside in the, in the garden. And I hope that our Conejo Pride group will uh, have another one, um, if not this year, then next year. All right. And now is a great moment, it's one of my favorite moments. It's our Community Commitment Award, and we had to postpone that from last month because we had 100 speakers for the general plan update and we worked until midnight for that, so we had to postpone this. I am so pleased to be able to welcome the fifth recipient of our monthly Community Commitment Award, and her name is Mia Perry. A former foster youth herself, Mia has spent the past two years devoting herself to helping other children in foster care through James Storehouse. Even during the most demanding months of the pandemic, Mia jumped in to assist the most vulnerable among us. Mia has a special gift for working with the foster youth and provides them with valuable emotional support and encouragement. As the director of James Storehouse, Stacy DeWitt, explained in her nomination of Mia, Mia brings joy to everyone she encounters and is a bright light in our community. Please meet Mia Perry. So we're working on the technical issues. City. When that is figured out, we're going to rewind the and video. here is your community commitment. Okay, can we stop the video and take it from the beginning? There you go. Sorry about that. I'm Claudia Bill de la Pena, mayor for the city of Thousand Oaks. And today I will present the Community Commitment Award for the month of May to an extraordinary person. Her name is Maya Perry. Congratulations, Thank Maya. Thank you so much. This is for you on behalf of the uh, city council and the city. Thank you. And here is your community commitment award. Thank you Congratulations. so much. Congratulations. Now Maya, this award goes only to very, very special people. After the year that we have had during the pandemic, the year of 2020, we want 2021 to be the year of light. And we are looking for rays of light and you are one bright, ray of light here Thank in our you. community because of your extraordinary contribution and passion for foster youth here at James Storehouse in Thousand Oaks. You've worked and actually volunteered for them. Yeah. What, three, three years? years. Yeah. Yes. Tell us what uh, you uh, are doing with uh, foster youth from the little babies to, to older kids. We just give clothing items and whatever they might need to them um, to help them thrive and grow and 
be great in the community. So as someone who has gone through the foster system yourself, why are you doing this? Just to give back and I wasn't able, we didn't have anything like this growing up. So it was just time like, got a lot of like hand-me-downs and stuff. So it's nice to give, to be able to give and give back to the community. You were just simply extraordinary during the pandemic where everybody was so afraid to get out of their houses yes. to help others, uh, yet you didn't even think twice about it. Tell us why. I'm not much of a homebody, so when they said everyone has to stay home, I'm like, okay, what can I do that I can still get out and see at least a few people? Um, and it was just helping volunteer and keep me busy. <laughs> How does that make you feel when you reflect upon your own experience? I just love it. I love seeing their smiles, like the little toys that they get, or a simple clothing item. Just it makes me happy. Maya, I am so excited that you're receiving this award. You are so deserving of this award. You are an incredible person. We are so blessed to have you here at James Storehouse for these three years and looking forward to more. Your intuition and your care for people is really, really genuine. And you are our baby care specialist. Whenever we have, <laughs> we have baby gear <laughs> that people are needing, foster parents are needing for the placement of the children, and we don't know exactly what we need to get, you know exactly what stroller, exactly what car seat, and you make everyone feel cared for and loved. We are so proud to know you, and you are a bright light in the community. Thank you. What do you want the community to know about foster care and foster kids? that there is always children in need. And if they could ever help, it'd be a blessing on them and everybody else. If you in the community know of anyone that is a special person who has dedicated himself or herself to helping others, then please go to the website, www.toaks.org forward slash CCA and nominate him or her or them for this particular award where we really want to celebrate our unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. And Maya, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it was it's okay. <laughs> Uh, Maya and Stacy are here in person today. That is so wonderful. You're our first uh, recipient to be here in person since we opened up City Hall again to the public. And what a delight it is to see you. Maya, if you want to say well, a few words, you're welcome or yeah. Stacy. Congratulations. You for, thank you for this honor. Thank you. you. You're doing so much and you're a wonderful example. You're a success story. You, you really are. You should be thank proud you so of yourself. Much. Uh, Stacy, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this special honor and for shining a light on the children in our community who are experiencing foster care. Thank you. It's great to see you. you Good luck with everything else. Thank you. Keep us updated. So we are highlighting various people, and we have been doing that since January to show that Thousand Oaks is a caring community. We have hardworking people here that will really break stereotype and really um, change people's expectations. There is so much good in this community, and you know it is just wonderful. And I know that James Storehouse is, is faith-based, and it is it is just great to have you, and. Um, I really want our community to see all the many race that we have and make our community special. Kindness is what counts. Compassion is what counts. And um, I really appreciate that very much. So thank you. And with that, we're going to go to public comments. Um, Madam Clerk. This is a time and place for public comments. A speaker card is available for those wishing to address the City Council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction. Speakers for public hearing during the public hearing. Council as a whole and all documents and the official clerk speaking. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence. Ten individuals have presented cards and pursuant to council standards. Speakers are allowed three minutes and the yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. 
Thank you. So we're taking these speakers in the order in which they registered. We, we put out our agenda at five o'clock on Thursdays, the week before the council meeting, and that is when you have a chance to go in and register. So the names that I'm calling are the names that were um, received when they registered. All right, uh, first up we have Jeff Schwartz, followed by Gloria, and then Clint F. Again, you have three minutes, Madam Clerk, is that what you said? Because you were breaking up a little. Okay, three minutes, and uh, if you would please state your place of residence, that would be wonderful, or city of residence. Good evening. Jeff is joining us via Zoom, I believe, yes? Is Jeff with us? If not, we can go to Gloria, who is number two on the list. And Gloria is also joining us via video. And if Gloria is not there, how about Clint? Clint from Thousand Oaks, joining us via video. Hello, and anybody yes. there? Yes. Hello. So who oh, is calling? Is Gloria. it Gloria? Gloria, since we have you, why don't you go ahead? Oh, thank you so much. I, I uh, had problems. Okay. Ventura County Health, oh, Gloria Newberry Park. Ventura County Health Department safety disinformation of so-called vaccine. During May 18, 2021 COVID report, Mr. Vargas spits out disinformation about COVID jabs saying vaccines are very effective and safe, prevent serious illness and prevent death with no indication of sterilization. Let's analyze falsehoods. According to CDC's VAERS system from 2009 to 2019, less than 1600 deaths. Contrasting the four months in 2021, 4,000 deaths, 30 dying daily, Vargas deception is an outrage. We know it's only one to 10% of actual deaths and adverse reactions, likely vastly higher. Safety trials end in 2023. Hiding from the public, our animal trials halted because why? All animals died. Connecticut published Modera Vax ingredients include deadly poison SM102 not for human or veterinary use. Sterilization, there's been a 366% increase in miscarriages from December 9, 2020 to March 7, 2021. Clearly, the government hired behavior psychologist statements, coerce and manipulate public opinion to take the jab using deceit. Where's the evidence? With private businesses, responsibility and constitutional role of our government is protecting rights of the individual and do no harm, so do your job. Do we have Jeff Schwartz? Is he back? If not, we will go to Clint. No Clint, okay. Then Jennifer Gross. Do we have Jennifer Gross? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Jennifer Gross, and I'm a 40-year resident of Newberry Park. In addition to my concerns about traffic, the vision Mr. Maradian has been sharing with the neighbors of the Borcher property will eliminate the view of the mountains that I've enjoyed for nearly 20 years, as well as the views of my neighbors enjoy. I find the timing of Mr. McNamee's Facebook post interesting. Yes, it's the day of the council meeting, but yesterday they also finished not only mowing the orchard lot, but stripping it down to the dirt with a tractor. It took a couple days. That's what I want to talk about tonight, the plowing of the orchard lot. A dirt lot, as Mr. McNamee calls it. It not, is not even what you would see in June after the orchard lot was mowed for weed abatement. You would see a mowed lot, vegetation mowed to a few inches from the ground throughout the property. And throughout the year, the vegetation would grow back. For 40 years, the only time that lot was mowed was for weed abatement, until sometime last year, or perhaps late 2019. Then it started to be plowed regularly. 
maybe once a month or every six weeks. And that's continued through yesterday. I thought it was to keep it neat to impress someone. But after Mr. McNamee's comments last council meeting, I think it was to keep it looking like a dirt lot, which is not what it typically looks like. It is the look Mr. Maradian has created over the past year or so. I've been hoping for a really good rainy winter so that those who don't know anything about that property but are now paying attention can see what it's like after a winter of good rain. Lakes form, the cattails grow taller than me and the ground can stay wet all year after one good winter of rain. But if we have a good rain this year, it will be different because the vegetation isn't being permitted to grow and who knows what that will bring. Perhaps some catastrophe of mud that we have never seen here is in the works. I can only anticipate what Mr. Maradian and Mr. McNamee will then say about the mud lake that couldn't possibly be a flood pane because there is no vegetation. I personally respect authenticity over, over manipulation of perception, of perception, thank you. Thank you. We have next Dan Twed, followed by Karen Wilburn. Dan is joining us via video. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. I wanted to speak tonight about the possibility for there to be a local uh, bazaar, kind of a craft maker fair uh, that could be held after the Thousand Oaks Farmer's Market that occurs on Thursdays. I think um, there's a lot of interest for this idea on the appnextdoor.com and I've actually started a group there uh, to pursue that and it would be great to get some direction from the city about uh, how to pursue a project like that. There's uh, a large maker community in the Conejo Valley. I'm a member of the Conejo Valley Makers and I just joined the uh, Thousand Oaks Maker Group on Nextdoor that has 101 members. Uh, the Rotary Club, of course, does the annual street fair, but uh, I think it'd be great for civic identity and engagement to have a, a event that occurs more often. Uh, in fact, I'll be having a booth next to the Conejo Valley Maker booth at the October 17th Rotary Club fair, and I'm hoping that we get a great turnout for that. The COVID Pandemic time has been very hard, and I think people are really eager to get out and have some uh, interesting evening events to uh, participate in. So I would just uh, hope that this can be put together. I know the, the Thousand Oaks uh, Farmer's Market is very restricted in, in the kind of vendoring, vendors they can allow because they're a Department of Agriculture uh, entity, and you can't do any kind of thing but food there, and it's very tightly uh, regulated. So that's my comment, and if I could get some direction about uh, what department of the city could perhaps be useful in coordinating an event like that. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. The city manager will make comments at the end of public comments. Our next speaker is Karen Wilburn, followed by Julie Diacomo, and then our own police chief. Oh, yes. Is it Karen? Yes. Are you Karen? Okay. Sorry, I thought it was important to be here in person. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Honorable council members, Yesterday, Councilman McMoney posted misinformation on his Facebook page, accusing Linda Parks of blocking development on the Borchard parcel to compel the property owner to sell the land to the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. This was a blatant untruth. This caused a flurry of posts in support of Parks, and at 2.30 today, he took down his post and all the replies. However, the false information had already been read by many. Fact, this has been on the Conservancy's wish list. This is no secret, and Ms. Parks has had discussions with the owner. That does not constitute blocking development. 
fact, there has never been an approved plan on this lot as claimed in Mr. McNamee's Facebook post. That is the big lie. Fact, the city has only been approached twice with development proposals. The first was in 1991. Ms. Parks was not even on the planning commission. The plan was either denied or withdrawn by the owner because mitigation costs were prohibitive. Then in 2003, Centex Homes drew preliminary plans. After discussion with the planning department, they too realized the costs involved and withdrew their offer to buy the property. Those plans never even made it to the planning commission. In 2003, Linda Parks was a county supervisor and had no power over the issue. Fact, neither of these proposals occurred during a period in which the supervisor had any jurisdiction to affect the outcome. So big lie number two. Mr. McNamee clearly has a political bias against Ms. Parks, and that is his right. However, as a member of the city council, I do not believe he has the right to use his position to forward his own personal agenda and at the expense of the residents of Newberry Park. This is politicking at its ugliest. Councilman McNamee, I am publicly calling on you to support your allegations. When and what specific actions has Supervisor Park taken that have prevented development? When were these supposed approved plans approved? If she has done as you've claimed, you should be able to provide this information. I respectfully ask the other council members to encourage Mr. McNamee to comply with our request. And I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wilburn. Um, I, I received a statement here or a question about comments being directed to the whole council. Normally we direct, ask speakers to direct comments to the whole council. Uh, in this case, I understand that you are pointing out a specific post on social media and therefore um, are addressing not only the whole council but a specific council member as well. All right. Next, we have Julia Giacomo, or Giacomo, not sure if Julia is here or, oh, there you are, okay, very good. And then after Julia, we have our own police chief, Jim Fryhoff, and then Andy Levine and Sharon Moret. Hello. I'm gonna talk fast so I can get this all in in my time. Good evening, my name is Jules Daikano. I was born here in Thousand Oaks in 83 and moved back almost a year ago from Camarillo, where I have lived for 36 years. My concerns I bring before you this evening are in relation to our water supply and its contents, our pipelines, and toxic mold exposure. This could be affecting the health and safety of the families in this community just as quickly, I believe, as it is also trying to be covered up and avoided from the public's knowledge. I'm speaking about the, this from my personal experience and my current situation. I bring this information in front of you, not just with three high levels of toxic mold in my system, but with all due respect and to voice concern and to create awareness. With law and criminal justice in my background, I was natural, it was natural to investigate this further, but most of all necessary in order to protect myself and family. I've lived off Hillcrest Drive the last year, and these past eight months especially, I've closely documented and experienced constant problems with the water and pipes. However, with, however, with older buildings, it was somewhat to be expected to a degree, until it rapidly got worse and black started to appear on all surfaces anywhere inside the home, then seeping through the walls, covering the community jacuzzi, interfering with the sprinkler systems, etc. The integrity of my health was also becoming more apparent, especially after getting airlifted off the top of a mountain during a hike because my lungs were literally poisoned. Unfortunately, with my case, the property's management neglected to take my concerns serious, and I took matters into my own hands. I had experts come and take numerous samples to be tested at the lab, followed by an allergy and test, an allergy test and blood test. Once the results came back, I contacted numerous agencies within the city, county, and state with my concerns. Not only are the other tenants and their families affected in the apartment complex where I live, but shockingly, so many others from this community at this very moment are as well. Even the priest himself from St. Jude's was recently severely sick from toxic mold exposure in his home. There's a sweet retired couple I met recently at the hotel that I've been staying at who are also staying for similar reasons. Even my physician I've been seeing forever shared his story. And to get even more crazy, Erin Brockovich herself, after experiencing problems with mold contamination in her own home in Gore Hills, received settlements of $430,000 from two parties and an undisclosed amount from a third party to settle her lawsuit. 
alleging toxic mold. The most alarming factors was when I went to get my water tested and couldn't find anywhere available or even offering water testing. When I called the numerous water, co water companies, none of them would even tell me where our water supply came from or who even to direct me to. I'm sorry, but as a mother, I believe I have the right to know what my children are bathing and swimming in and possibly being exposed to. Next alarming and most obvious factor, attorneys are taking cases, aren't taking cases anymore in this area relating to toxic and or water map toxic mold or water damage. Not even Aaron Brockovich's attorney, who was one of the dozens I personally spoke with, which makes me conclude that they're most likely being threatened or paid off not to take on these cases. Even going on local hikes and noticing the water contamination and extreme water shortage just within these past few months alone is extremely alarming. Our pets are also being affected, who drink the water more than any of us and are having unusual health issues and abnormality, abnormalities, such as gross infections, even death. I personally don't believe in coincidences, but everything aside, I would like to know basic information about our water. Where does it come from? And most importantly, what is in it? What started off as a private and civil concern about my in particular residence has now possibly become a huge classic action, civil lawsuit. As Dave Asprey quotes, environmental toxic mold exposure is a massive health crisis that very few are aware of. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak before you. And any suggestion, referral, or guidance would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Staff will address your comments. Um, next, we have Police Chief, Thousand Oaks Police Chief Jim Fryhoff speaking for Catherine Beck. Yes, good evening. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, staff. Um, one of our local residents who is currently experiencing homelessness um, just asked me when I got here if I would speak on her behalf to show support for those uh, organizations, including Lutheran Social Services, who do provide services for our homelessness. For, for them to continue to be able to have the support from the community so they can provide those needed services. Thank you. And she didn't mention Harbor House? <laughs> no, LSS, okay. but Harbor House is also a, a great nonprofit okay. that is able to help with uh, our people experiencing homelessness here. In, Thank you. In Thank you, Chief. That's great. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, our last two speakers are Andy Levine and Sharon Moret. Welcome back to City Hall. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, Andy Levine, New Bay Park, California. Um, good, good evening, City Council, staff, and public. At the most recent City Council meeting, a staff person responded to a resident who asked that residents be able to vote on the huge change that the state was requiring a city to do or else face process of, of losing state funding. The staff member replied of, a vote was not required. I remember when the City Council a um, member lost her seat when she called residents NIMBYs. I would like the city council to vote openly on this matter to see who respects the public and who does not care about the public. Some of the city council members have lost their way. Their roots used to be in soul growth. Council member Ed Jones used to be in the forefront as he seems more than anyone else to be sending the people. Mass amounts of affordable housing has already designated for Newbury Park. Affordable housing does not help pay for the bills. We also need recreation in Newbury Park, including a theater. And for a side note too, I think Newbury Park is taking so much of the brunt of things and we need other things. If there's a big fire like what happened a couple of years ago, how are we supposed to get out in time if we're gonna have so many people? And that maybe it's time for people in Newbury Park to get together and say, we, we, need to be, we need to be our own city. And for the second comment I have is, the state has imposed their will, sometimes wrongly and sometimes correctly. A Ventura County Supervisor may be recalled because she enforced the laws that the state set down, including calling wine stores and central businesses and house of worship non-essential. The Supreme Court has now ruled against calling house of worship non-essential. Thank you. Sharon Moret. Good evening, council and public. The state has already lost population, not gained. They have lost major businesses that are moving to states without income taxes. I had already asked Jackie Irwin to look into states that have, that have best practices to lower our taxes. Uh, however, this has not been done. Instead of bowing to the state, 
we, make, we have to make sure that the state answers vital questions. Uh, adding thousands upon thousands of new housing will not benefit our community. Currently, the electricity, we have blackouts. We need a desalination plant. Um, uh, we need more sheriffs. We have to uh, buy a security system because twice we had people that tried to break into our house and the sheriffs could not come in a timely manner. Um, let's see. Um, uh, a shelter needs to be built and shared by Ventura County cities. Um, instead of making our parks dangerous, um, and also, uh, shuttles are very expensive now. Uh, uh, this will be something that will add to the problems. Um, let's see. Uh, we need um, a lot of questions to be answered by the state, and nothing should be done in a hurried manner. Um, our citizens deserve the right to vote because this is major, major changes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Moret. That concludes our public comments and I will now turn it, o now turn it over to our city manager. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor Bilda Pena. Um, just two matters of follow up. We'll have staff follow up with um, uh, Mr. Tweed, his uh, questions regarding the uh, Makers Fair um, to go in conjunction with the uh, Farmer's Market. Uh, that's held at the, uh, the Oaks Mall on private property, but we'll be happy to uh, make the connection there and we'll follow up with them tomorrow. And uh, I saw that our both our Deputy Public Works Director uh, and uh, Assistant to the City Manager uh, followed up with the speaker regarding water quality concerns. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to address an, a comment brought up by the speaker who's actually leaving right now regarding Borchard Road. I just wanted to um, uh, clarify that there was actually in 1977, and this is information is from staff, uh, that there was a development approved in 1977. Linda Parks was probably a high school student at the time. Um, for 145 lots for single-family detached homes. That was approved by the City Council in 1978, but it was never constructed. And since then, there have, has never been a proposal that, was, that went through the official planning process, not even to the Planning Commission or, or even uh, the City Council. So I just wanted to, to, to bring that up since it was brought up during public comments. All right, and with that, we will go to uh, the consent calendar. Any item that my colleagues would like to remove or pull out to discuss? Let me see, Mr. Adam. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, no need to pull anything here, but I did want to comment on two items. Uh, flashing the flashing yellow arrows for left turns very popular here in the city keeps traffic moving we have 14 of them now this consent calendar will add seven more and we've identified 20 in the future so uh, we're going to keep traffic moving here in the city of thousand oaks and we are going to build a sidewalk along los Feliz, which runs parallel to thousand oaks boulevard uh, it's a mile long we're going to have more parking we're going to widen the streets we're gonna put in a sidewalk and it connects directly to Conejo Elementary School so kids can walk up that sidewalk and go to school. So just one more effort on the city to keep people hopefully walking and maybe out of their cars. Thank Madam you. Madam Mayor. Mr. Jones. I'd just like to say that I, uh, I like the taste that we have in elevator companies. Uh, I particularly like the name Next Level. Are there any other items that my colleagues would like to pull from the consent Good, calendar? Uh, if not, then I'm asking for uh, a motion. I'll move we approve the consent okay, calendar. Okay, motion by Mr. Jones. Can we please have a roll call, Madam Clerk? Councilmember Adam? Yes. 
Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Angler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 5 0. Excellent. We will now go to our public hearing, which is the almost half a billion dollar budget. So, um, Madam <coughs> Clerk, could you please open the public hearing? Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item 8A, the proposed fiscal year 21 22 and 2022-23 operating and capital improvement program budgets. And Madam Mayor, at this time, we do not have any speakers. Thank you. Let me see here. Let me go find the page. I think we will go to our most excellent finance director, Jamie Boscarino, for the presentation. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members. It's nice to actually be able to give this presentation here in person. Um, didn't, wasn't sure during this whole six month budget process if I'd be able to get to this point and actually present you in person. So it, it's nice to be able to be, be here doing this. Um, I'm presenting our fiscal year 2021 22 and fiscal year 2022 23 operating and CIP budgets. This is the final step and culmination of a thorough, comprehensive, and strategic budget preparation process. So tonight is our public hearing, and you'll be asked after the public hearing is closed to adopt the operating and CIP budgets for the next two fiscal years. We went into great detail at the budget study session, so tonight is a high-level presentation and highlighting some changes that we've made since the budget study sessions. The city's operating and CIB budget process actually began before what's shown on this timeline all the way back in October with our CIP budget kickoff meeting. The first of several city council presentations was in April for the CIP budget study session. Both the CIP budget and the operating budget were discussed in great detail at each of the study sessions, as well as meetings with our city council capital facilities committee and our finance audit committee. Our budget engagement and outreach was also ongoing during this calendar year as well. Since I went into detail at the study session on our budget engagement process and our efforts that we undertook um, throughout the past five months, flexibility and creativity was a key this year due to the challenges that COVID presented. A new budget website was created, www.tobudget.org. The goal was to help residents gain a basic understanding of the municipal budget process. Finalizing our engagement statistics from our campaign, we reached over 38,000. We had 201 survey submissions and almost 800 unique visitors to our website and about 1,500 website page views. So overall, we feel that this was a very successful engagement process this go around. Our budget theme is Moving TO with a focus on workplace transformation, financial resilience, and technology investment and innovation. As part of workplace transformation, vacant budgeted positions were realigned to more adequately meet current and future needs and services, such as providing a staff liaison for the community to work with nonprofits and community groups, budget for staff training, including our new DIBS initiative, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, Financial resilience is a core component of our budget process, and we focus on efficiencies and looking long-term into the future. Technology innovation continues to advance and revolutionize the way people work, and I think we all saw this over the past year. Funding is included for technology initiatives, including a new city website that will be ADA compliant, and specifically including additional funding for cybersecurity efforts, which is a critical investment in securing our IT systems and infrastructure. The American Rescue Plan that was passed is enabling the city to respond, rebuild, and recover, with over
city and to achieve city council's priority um, for affordable housing and homelessness. Also included are environmental sustainability projects such as development of our city's first climate and environmental action plan, solar projects, and a microgrid plant at our municipal service center. There were a few minor changes to CIP projects. Um, we transferred some budget from our trash full capture device installation project to the South Branch Arroyo Conejo Improvements Project. Um, we increased the Jans Road bike lanes project by a small amount, and the pavement overlay project was decreased by a very small amount. Included in the city's budget are the city's financial and budget policies, which are central and key to our strategic long-term approach to sound financial management. It's a best practice of the Government Finance Officers Association to have and also adhere to financial and budget policies. Staff reviews these policies at least every two years, if not annually, such as our investment policy, which is presented to City Council every year for adoption. In fact, the city was informed just last week that it is a winner of GFOA's first ever financial policy challenge. And this is a testament to our city's sound financial practices. In summary, the proposed budget is structurally balanced and represents a fiscally sustainable spending plan for the next two years, while at the same time significantly investing back into our community. This is a positive budget message coming as we are cautiously reopening our economy and returning back to some semblance of normal. We continue to be proactive in our fiscal management and focused on the long term. And most importantly, our proposed budget includes funding specifically towards achieving City Council's top goals and priorities. And before ending, I wanted to thank key city staff that were an integral part of the development of this proposed budget. This encompasses staff from every single department in the city um, working together to present a balanced spending plan addressing the needs of the community and again, um, City Council's goals and priorities. And specifically, we'd like to thank our city manager's office and their guidance and development of the budget, as well as the finance budget team, and specifically our deputy finance director, Carrie Madsen, and Brent Sakaida, our budget officer. So staff's recommendations are to adopt the resolution approving the proposed operating and CIP budgets for the next two fiscal years to adopt the updated financial and budget policies, including our governmental fund balances and designations policy, and to authorize the city manager to carry over funds into our next two fiscal years. And with that, myself and others are av 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 available to answer any questions. You're able to answer questions and available to yes. answer questions. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so very much for this wonderful report. It is solid and it is a good body of work, of financial work. Um, kudos to you and your staff and you also com rec um, commended the city, uh, city manager's office. Um, it is something that the city of Thousand Oaks can be very proud of. Uh, we do have a question already coming from council member Kevin McNamee, followed by Ed Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Jamie, again, I'd, I'd like to echo what the mayor said, that congratulations on doing a wonderful job you and your team have put together a half a billion dollar proposal and those numbers from millions to billions, that's a big difference. So thank you again for your excellent work. I uh, just also want to comment that I'm a very big proponent and supporter of the library system. In my opinion, if you wish to reduce crime, uh, reduce unemployment, get the children and their parents to use a strong library system to give them uh, possibilities of what can be in the future through reading. And uh, I am glad we've got a, from the sale and purchase of homes here that our revenue has gone up a million dollars for uh, the library system. So I hope that trend continues so that way we can continue to support a strong library system and uh, provide opportunities for our youth to find their purpose in life and uh, other opportunities. So thank you, Jamie, for your excellent work on this. Thank you. Councilmember Jones. Yeah, uh, uh, Jamie, I wonder now that we are hopefully about to conclude this uh, period of time in which we've been, uh, you know, having the COVID pandemic to cope with, uh, I'm just wondering what would you say in this last fiscal year that we're completing now has been the impact of the pandemic and the federal government 
rescue plan, whatever the <laughs> official name of it is. In other words, what, what has been the net effect of that on our uh, finances here in Thousand Oaks? So, Councilmember Jones, we've certainly experienced negative impacts as far as revenues. Um, specifically, I think the largest impact was with our transit occupancy tax revenue. Um, as people aren't traveling, they're not staying in hotels, and our TOT revenue was reduced by over 50%, so several million dollars. We saw a reduction in that, and um, that, that was the largest impact in revenue sources, but we also, of course, that was with the general fund, our theaters is closed for over a year. We were not able to serve our community and have performances in our theater, and, and that was a huge loss to our residents and other residents in near neighboring cities to not be able to have our theaters open and operating. And even at our golf course, although golf was great, you know, we hold special events, weddings, bat mitzvahs at our golf course, and you know, the community wasn't able to celebrate those accomplishments and, and special events in their life. And so um, we saw significant losses in revenue in both our golf course and our theaters as well. Um, the positive thing with our American Rescue Plan that was passed by President, you know, signed by President Biden is that we're getting $14 million over the next two years back into our city. And that is enabling us to safely reopen our theaters and to start providing performance to the public over the next couple of years and do it in a safe manner. And also, um, that's helping us with this reinvestment that we're doing back into the community and $10 million for affordable housing and homelessness efforts and projects. Um, so that's sort of been the benefit of getting the funding from our federal government, is that we're turning that right around and getting that back as quickly as we can reinvested back into our community. So the net effect then with uh, the re reception of the federal money has uh, has not been too bad. The, the are, are we pretty well on an even basis because of that uh, funding, or ha are we still a little bit uh, in the hole from the pandemic? So it's we're not done with our fiscal year yet. So we're we're still waiting to see how the end of the fiscal year um, ends up rolling out. Um, there's certainly lots more that we could do as a city if we were able to receive additional funding. Um, so net effect, I mean, we lost from our current counts over 15 million dollars. Um, across all of our funds, it could be higher, and we're getting 14 million. So, you know, there's net, there's still a loss that our city has experienced. Um, we're certainly more well off than a lot of other cities that rely more on tourism. You know, Anaheim, beach cities, they rely heavily on tourism. Um, so, you know, we're we're not as poorly off as other cities throughout the United States, um, but there certainly is still an, a net negative loss to our city. And if I might add to that, Councilmember Jones, that um, we did take uh, swift action at the beginning of the pandemic that helped stem the bleeding, both last fiscal year and this fiscal year. So what Jamie's talking about is revenue loss, which we certainly experienced, but we saw net returns to fund balance both last year and this year. Uh, so that's what's enabled us to have this community reinvestment fund. Thank you. Mr. M Mayor Pro Tem, Bob Engler, and then Council Member Adam. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, uh, I'll echo some of my other colleagues. Um, Ms. Boscarino, good job on the uh, report. And um, kudos to your staff on all the hard work done. Um, as, as I look at the budget, um, I'm impressed that, uh, as you mentioned, some other cities did not fare quite as well as we have um, coming out of the recession. Um, the, you mentioned uh, your conservative viewpoint on some of the things. Can you elucidate that a little bit more? How do you, how do you take a conservative view of some of the things in the future? Right, so I think the one example I would give would probably be with our TOT revenue. We're only estimating three million in TOT revenue this next, this first fiscal year of the proposed budget. Um, in normal years, we'd bring in 4.7 million to 5 million. It's very possible that 
when we reopen on June 15th and you know life gets to somewhat back to normal and if we don't have any setbacks over the next year that people will be there will be pent up demand for travel ride and our hotels will get right back to being fully in business and we could bring in you know over four million dollars but we're just being conservative um, to hedge against if there is anything that happens again that we have to do a little more closures um, and that's why we're only budgeting three million whereas we potentially could see more than four million back in our TOT revenue. So that's just one example of where we're being a little more conservative and cautious. It, it's nice that we're able to keep that conservative viewpoint on some things. Um, this budget also is going to help support uh, bringing back our, our um, theaters. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan, um, we're getting money in to offset the losses that the theaters occur incurred over the past almost year and a half of being closed. Um, we'll get several million dollars that is going into our theaters to be able to reopen um, our theaters and bring the public safely back into our theaters. We also applied for the Shuttered Venues Grant that um, was offered by the federal government and we're hoping we'll find out relatively quickly that we were successful in getting grant revenue from the Shuttered Venues Grant for our theaters as well. Yes, uh, mayor, the mayor and I did uh, both lobby the other day for that. Uh, hopefully the, our senators heard. Um, and, and the $10 million that uh, you're, you have refunded the housing um, uh, fund with, um, what is the source of that money? So that will come from the general fund reserves. Um, as we know, we sit, we had a $12 million surplus last fiscal year, and we set aside about $10 million, $11 million of that for COVID investment, reinvestment back into our community. So we're utilizing that funding that was set aside for reinvestment into our community and pointing that towards affordable housing and homelessness efforts. And then, and then looking forward more distant into the future, um, I know that we are, we are, uh, our, our PERS liabilities, are we still funding that as well to bring that long-term uh, liability down? Absolutely. Um, we just uh, sent off another one and a half million additional payment from this June because we had savings and salaries and benefits, and that was one of our multifaceted avenues of approach uh, to our unfunded liability. Of course, we set up our pension trust fund with 22 and a half million. Um, City Council approved that in 2018. Our last statement, we had brought that balance from 22 and a half million just two and a half years ago to almost $30 million. So just in two and a half years, we've added seven and a half million dollars um, in that trust fund that we will be able to hopefully in the near future put that towards paying off our unfunded liability. Um, and then of course doing the fresh start program with CalPERS and we reduced our mortgage you could say from a 30 year to a 15 year. Um, I think we've paid off two years because that was in 2018 of that 15 years. So we have 13 years left to go on that. Um, so we were being prudent and not putting all our eggs in one basket and we're doing several different things to our approach to reducing and hopefully in the next within 10 years, I would say paying off our unfunded liability. Thank you, Ms. Boscarino. Yep. Mr. Adam. Well, thank you, Mayor. And uh, this really is a strong, positive, balanced budget that will, in fact, move Thousand Oaks forward over the next two years. Appreciate all your hard work on it. Um, when I look at some of the projects that we have pending, a, a tremendous community uh, benefit. As you mentioned, we have a 58-mile street resurfacing project, the biggest street resurfacing project in the history of the city, which will, per usual, give us the number one rated roads in the county. Uh, we're going to finish up the Conejo Creek Southwest Park uh, in uh, conjunction with the Conejo Rick and Park District. We set aside $15 million for affordable housing and to address homelessness, which I think everybody's in favor of. Uh, we're going to give a million dollars to the arts and some of the nonprofit groups here in town. We're going to build sidewalks in Willow Lane, which will connect the Kmart area to our downtown. Uh, we're incentivizing our theaters. We're going to overhaul our website. I mean, th these are just a few of the highlights that we'll be doing. And, and per our goal, our number one goal of uh, equity and inclusion, we're going to be funded, funding Lutheran Social Services, Safe Passage, Adelante Comunidad, Westminster Free Clinic, a lot of great nonprofits here in the city. So we spend wisely, 
but we also save wisely. And I know you're always on the lookout to save us a few dollars, Jamie, and really appreciate it. As you mentioned with our pension uh, refinancing, it's gonna save taxpayers $30 million over the next 10 to 15 years. We put aside some money to in a pension stabilization fund. It was invested so wisely, you gained $8 million on it. That's very env enviable return for someone in the financial services business. Not bad. We've refinanced our library bonds. We're saving hundreds of thousands there. We just changed our wastewater billing. We're going to save thousands of dollars there. So again, it's wise spending, but also vigilant saving. And I know you're always on the lookout for that. So we've got long-term fiscal st stability here in the city. Um, we have low debt, and most importantly, uh, we're gonna stay a low tax city. We have the lowest sales tax in the county, and um, I think it's just a great benefit to the people that live here in Thousand Oaks. I'm proud of the way you put this thing together and all the departments that were involved. So I guess that kind of sums it up, and maybe I could make a motion if that would I, be I, all right. I, I, I had some questions, though, oh, because it's a public sorry, hearing. Mayor. I have. <laughs> <laughs> last yes. but not least. So I have that's not the problem with being mayor. You're always, yeah. you're that's right. Last. I'm the last one. That's the yeah. disadvantage. So you have to go last. Well, <laughs> by all means. Uh, I also have to close the public hearing after I ask my questions. Um, all right. The question I have is that there have been a few changes since the study session. Uh, Ms. Boscarino, uh, among them is the CIP budget change of the... Uh, $50,000 transfer to the South Branch Royo Conejo improvements. Can you elaborate on that? I'm going to let our either deputy public works director or public works director come down and discuss that change. Sorry, I put you on the spot there, Cliff. Or Natter. Cliff, okay, our public works director. It's the uh, trash full capture device installation. Oh yes, okay, thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't have. <laughs> yeah, didn't no, have that's open. fine. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, good evening. Um, yes, the uh, the transfer is uh, simply to uh, we we are hoping to work on getting the uh, the folks over in the um, off of Orchard Road out of the floodplain. So this is to fund a study. We're moving that money over to do that project. Or did I go the wrong direction there? No, I think this is it. Now, we had a study done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Yes. So how did that go? So that is um, concluding, actually. Um, they have decided that uh, there is not enough evidence to, for them to continue to participate in the project. But it has allowed us to work with, closely with the county so we're now going to be looking at a project jointly with the county that might improve the flood zone out in that area. Thank you so much for that news. I appreciate that. All right. And with that, I um, wanted to just, again, thank staff. Oh, uh, Mr. Powers. Uh, just before the council acts, I, I don't want to speak after uh, after you've taken action. I just uh, would be remiss if uh, I didn't once again um, uh, say a special thank you to our finance director, Jamie Boscarino, um, as somebody that does a lot of uh, recruiting uh, for various positions across the state. Um, I can tell you that we are extremely fortunate and well served um, with Ms. Boscarino's leadership. And as evidenced by this, there's really nothing more consequential that a city council does than adopt a budget uh, and a two-year budget. And to have a budget uh, as strong, perhaps one of the strongest that uh, I've been fortunate enough to see in, in my 20 years in local government. And uh, I'm uh, just uh, really pleased to work with a council that has a commitment uh, to st uh, strong fiscal practices and uh, a finance team and, and supporting resources in all the departments to get us to this point. So I just wanted to end with those thoughts. Thank you. I don't think there will be any more questions. So I will close the public hearing. And then what I would like to say is that, uh, indeed, this is a very strong budget coming out of a pandemic. Uh, this is simply amazing. And it could not have been done with the foresight, the pre-planning, and then the actual quick thinking in terms of how do we manage all of our employees. And I want to thank those employees that were furloughed and just hung in there. I really, really appreciate it, some of whom were actually disaster workers and helped with the um, different state programs to help the homeless, uh, with the vaccinations and so forth. 
Um, and I want to just kudos to Darren, Darren from the theaters department. Isn't he great? So he just, when, whenever you need him, he will jump in and help out. And, and that is what makes Thousand Oaks great. It's not, it's not the council. It is the employees, the employees who make Thousand Oaks great. And um, I just want to want to thank, uh, again, the finance department for that. And now, Mr. Adam, would you like to make your motion regarding the, um, the budget? Yes, the thank you, Mayor. Uh, appreciate that. With, uh, with all that in mind, I will move 8A, the uh, Operating and Capital Improvement Program budget for the City of Thousand Oaks for the next two years. Madam Clerk? Council Member Adam? Yes. Council Member Jones? Aye. Council Member McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 5 0. Excellent. Thank you. And don't forget, Jamie, don't forget the arts. The arts had been left holding the bag this entire year. And uh, they must be recognized and they must be helped. All of them in Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Um, we will now go to, I believe, the Youth Commission. Yes. All right. Let me go to that page real quick. All right. So we have the Youth Commission annual report, and this will be presented by graduating senior, who is graduating tomorrow, by the way, right? At uh, 5 o'clock, is it? From. Yes. From Westlake High School, my son will be playing in the band Pomp and Circumstance. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, but what's, what's even more special is that you persevered, all the seniors at all of our local high schools. Um, you persevered. You hung in there. Online schooling is, ugh, you don't even get me started. And you made it happen. You were resilient. I, I know that at Westlake High School, we had, believe it or not, 50 valedictorians, 5-0. I mean, in a pandemic year, is that crazy or what? Um, if, if, you know, you, if you graduate a valedictorian or even graduate, I mean, you are just a hero to me. <laughs> so um, you're here to present your last report with your two friends, uh, Catherine Shu and um, Shaylee, right? Is it Shaylee? Uh, you are special people. You are very, you are go-getters, and there is no doubt in my mind that you will succeed in life. But you couldn't have done it without Francine, right? Absolutely. There you go, Francine. I believe this is her last council meeting for the Youth Commission. At the end, we're going to give you a standing ovation, Francine. We have to. <laughs> So Ivy, I've talked long enough. Go ahead and please present your Youth Commission annual report. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Manager, and Staff. My name is Ivy Slosher. I am the 2020-2021 Chair of the Youth Commission. I'm a senior at Westlake High School, and this is my last year serving on the commission. As always, our year included hosting events and developing programs that had clear impacts on the community as determined by the 2020 Youth Leadership Summit and Implementation Plan. We had a challenging and exciting year, but we were resilient, adjusted to health orders, and never canceled a meeting or event. We had outstanding guest speakers at all live stream meetings on the topics of college planning, general plan, environmental education, transportation, inclusion, school safety, mental health, teen scans, scams, and vaping. At every meeting, we had school representatives from CVUSD schools and local private schools. This year, we also had the unique opportunity to participate on committees and provide input on two large city projects, the Climate Action Plan and the Thousand Oaks General Plan Amendment 2045. As you know, we have been hosting a dance for our peers with different abilities since 1974. This year, a committee chairs Alper and Friedman created and hosted a party in, the ba in a bag luau themed virtual dance. Participants picked up a bag of luau decor at the drive through and DJ Slick hosted a Zoom dance. Commissioners, staff, and guests 
danced for over one and a half hours, and had, the and had time to chat at the end of the party. It was a wonderful experience, even though it was not in person. We have also been implementing the Youth Recognition Award since 1980. This year, we had 110 nominations. We streamlined the process through a ranking system and honored 10 top winners. We delivered the awards to each of the nominators who arranged to be with the nominees during the Zoom presentation with the mayor. They were also honored in the ACORN newspaper. Based on feedback at last year's Youth Leadership Summit, the Youth Commission created implementation subcommittees, chaired by Commissioner Manuel, subcommittees each met independently and created events and action plans. I would like to introduce Commissioner Shaley McKeown to tell us more about the subcommittee's accomplishments. Good evening, City Council and Mayor. My name is Shaley McKeown and I have been on the Youth Commission for five years. The Mental Health and Vaping Subcommittee was led by Vice Chair Nash and Commissioners Friedman and Swanson. The group focused on mental health awareness and e-cigarette disadvantages. The subcommittee partnered with the local nonprofit profit Bright, Building Resilience and Inclusion Through Engagement, who presented at our December 2nd live stream meeting. Working with Bright, the group decided a virtual scavenger hunt simulation, which includes educational opportunities at each step, was the best choice for the target element for the target audience of elementary students. Bright has implemented the virtual reality scene into their exposition of behavioral health. I chaired the school safety team with the assistance of Commissioner Melton. The main goal was to help youth understand the importance and awareness in practicing school safety and make their students feel, and make their students feel safer in learning environments. The Thousand Oaks Police Chief James Fryhoff was invited to have an open dialogue meeting with the Youth Commission and community students about school safety, COVID safety, and overall community safety. The main project was writing an article using information from officials in the community. We interviewed Chief, Hi Chief Fryhoff and Dr. Hayek, the Deputy Superintendent of the Caneo Valley Unified School District. The article was published in April and sent, was published in April in the ACORN and sent to local high schools to be shared with their students. The recreation and inclusion team was led by Commissioner McCary, and they had quite the challenge, but they figured out a way to engage students. They worked with CRPD therapeutic unit staff to host a program for some of their part participants to be involved in created, creating marketing pieces for events. They decorated spaces, took pictures, and came up with the flyer for the therapeutic dance. The environmental subcommittee was led by Commissioner Shu. The topics of focus were education on climate change and environmental issues and providing youth with the resources to, be taken, to, be, to take action. This subcommittee created instructional videos that focused on environmental topics like repurposing. The, community, the committee worked with elementary school STEM teachers to distribute these videos to, a lar to reach a larger audience of youth. Educating youth at a young age, age is crucial for the future. The committee also co-sponsored a TEDx countdown event called TEDx Thousand Oaks, which focused on empowering youth in the community with resources to take action in combating the climate crisis. This event was hosted virtually, and speakers included Senator Henry Stern, Helen Cox, and students from Westlake High School. If you are interested in viewing any of these programs or educational pieces developed this year, please let us know and we will provide them to you. Now I would like to introduce Commissioner Catherine Shu. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and staff. My name is Katherine Shu, and I've been on the Youth Commission for three years. I will be a senior next year, so I'm looking forward to continuing to serve the community. This past year, we strive to participate more in our local government. We continued our partnership with the General Plan Committee, in which the staff of the committee participated at a forum at our March meeting, where over 50 youth attended to provide feedback for the land use survey. The commission also heard reports from me, about the Climate Action Plan and, and Commissioner Emanuel, who sits on the General Plan Committee. The Commission has been interested in being more civically engaged and utilized to provide input in legislation, projects, programs that affect youth. In the past three years, during my team, during my term, we have had the opportunity to be engaged in regional youth discussions, such as the National League of Cities, and a, and a leadership summit at CLU. So attending these 
conferences have allowed us to learn from what other youth are doing at their cities and in their communities. And we can bring these ideas back to our city as well. In the future, we hope to have more opportunities to attend and learn at these conferences. So we will be able to provide more input on local projects such as the general plan and the climate action plan. This has been a great benefit, not only to the youth, but to the city. The youth voice and youth perspective is now more important than ever. And it's crucial that we are heard when we're making decisions in the city. While we believe we have had a great impact over the years, some of our programs have, an, have been in existence for over 45 years. And while they are updated annually, we believe it is time to look at these programs in our purpose to make sure we are really making a difference in our community. Next term, we are recommending to the commission to find new ways to be heard and involved in planning, safety, diversity and inclusion, environment and other matters that, as they pertain to youth. We absolutely appreciate the opportunity to be engaged and um, assist with outreach in both the climate action plan and the general plan. Uh, we wanna thank the staff from both of these committees for including us in the process. And we hope to increasingly advise the city council and maintain direct communication to include youth perspectives in community matters. We encourage city staff, agencies, and city council to utilize us in projects and programs and to truly value the youth perspective that we bring to our community. We would like to thank staff from Caneo Valley Unified School District, Caneo Youth Employment Services, Caneo Recreation and Park District, the city, and volunteers for assisting us this term, especially our adult liaisons, Sarah Dobb, Liam Petrus, and Pete Martinez. Are there any questions? I'm going to ask my colleagues, are there any questions from my colleagues? I don't think we have any questions. Was that the end of your report? Mm -hmm. Well, on behalf of the council, I want to congratulate you on a wonderful conclusion to this year, uh, school year. Uh, Ivy, are you the only one graduating from the, uh, you are also graduating. Congratulations, the best of luck to you. Um, if you could uh, pass with flying colors through this pandemic, I'm sure your future is super bright. Um, and thank you for your contributions to the Youth Commission. And I would also like to take this opportunity because it is her last meeting as a Youth Commission advisor, so to speak, Francine Spriegel. Francine. It's been my pleasure. Francine, we'd like to take a picture of you with the, with the young ladies um, in front of the dais. Francine has been the coordinator, not only for the Youth Commission, but also the Council on Aging. She's the one who has been guiding our, our youth over the years through their many terms on the Youth Commission. And there has never been anyone quite like Francine. She is like a mother to everyone. She's like a best friend to everyone, a confidant. Um, Francine, you are very, very special. And thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and I'm sure my colleagues as well for all that you have done. And I know you're off um, into retirement, but um, you have made a difference in these young ladies and gentlemen's lives. They're going somewhere, they're going places, and you had a lot to do with that. If you wanna say a few words, please go ahead. It's been my pleasure. I, I couldn't have asked for a better place to work. Thank you. Well, you're a Thanks. woman of a few words, but <laughs> of great uh, <laughs> achievements. Go so. ahead, we're gonna take a picture.
Yeah, when you've worked with young students as long as Francine has, uh, they become like your own children, don't they, Francine? They do. Well, she works with the seniors as well. Yes, she does. She's their daughter. She's got, got some coming and going. <laughs> All right. And with that, we will move on to item 10B, which is a Community Funding Review Committee Social Services Endowment Fund grant recommendations. And for that, I will welcome the chair, Anne LaFienza, and I believe she is joining us via Zoom. Yes. Hi, Anne. Hi. It's so nice to see everyone, even on Zoom. And I would just like to reiterate before I begin that there is no one like Francine. She is That's true. very There's special no one. <laughs> and will be greatly no missed one. by all of us. So I would um, like to say good evening to the mayor and council members. My name is Anne LaFianza, and I am joining you tonight representing the Community Funding Review Committee, or CFRC, to present the recommendations for the fiscal year 2021-22 Social Service Endowment Fund Awards. The Social Services Endowment Fund, or SSEF, provides operational support grants to local nonprofit agencies offering essential public and social services to low-income persons in Thousand Oaks. The city's budget process includes the support of the SSEF program by appropriating $100,000 annually. City Council has awarded approximately 20 SSEF grants annually to social service organizations over the past 20 years. The SSCF grant applications were accepted from March 15, 2021 through April 15, 2021 for fiscal year 21-22. 23 interested applicants attended a grant workshop that was held virtually on March 17, 2021. Public outreach for the grant programs took place in March and April and included information on the city website, postings on social media channels, such as Facebook and Twitter, informational emails to previous SSEF grant applicants were also sent. 23 SSEF applications were received with a total request amount of $223,300. No applications were rejected for non-compliance with program requirements during staff's initial review. CFRC reviewed applications and scored them based on several criteria, including the organization's mission and background, program goals and objectives, and how low-income Thousand Oaks residents will benefit from the program. Additionally, past grant experience weighed heavily in the scoring rubric. In May 2019, the displayed funding formula was established by CFRC and has been used to recommend award amounts to City Council for all grants reviewed by the committee. Based on the original allocation method and CFRC scores, only 10 of the 23 applicants would have received funding for SSEF. During the May 12th meeting, the committee voted to amend the allocation method for this grant, opting to spread the SSEF funding amongst more organizations. The group agreed the nine applicants that received below 85 points and met the minimum $3,000 threshold would be recommended to receive $3,000 each for a total of 27,000. One applicant did not meet the minimum $3,000 city council threshold in resolution 2019 Dash 058. The remaining available funding of $73,000 would go to the 13 applicants that received 85 points and above based on the applicant's percentage where the original allocation method was applied to all applicants. See attached number three for committee's SSEF funding recommendation. This side shows the 13 applicants that scored 85 points and above. This slide shows applicants who scored below 85 points.
Upon approval by City Council, SSEF grantees will enter into agreements with the City for a grant period starting on July 1st, 2021. And now, Melissa Hurtado, Assistant to the City Manager, and Lynn Oshida, Community, De Community Development Analyst, are here to assist with any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad that the committee was able to help more organizations with this new funding. And I have to say that if it weren't for all of these organizations receiving funding uh, this evening during this pandemic year, if it weren't for them during this pandemic year, I don't know what would have happened to our seniors. I don't know what would have happened to our unhoused. I don't know what would have happened to our very low income families. Some of them are the hardest workers. They go to the Westminster Free Clinic for free health care. I don't know what would have happened to the families with food security if they hadn't had the help from MANA or many mansions, um, e even legal help. These, these organizations were the glue that kept our community together. I wish I could give a lot more money, but this is the only amount that we have available at this time. So thank you for being fair, for looking at everything and evalu evaluating all the organizations. Uh, certainly this is one of the best things that the city can do for its community. Do I have any questions or comments from my colleagues? None? Okay. Um, I don't have any questions for staff who are available. Uh, Mr. Heher, were you ready to say something? No, just that we need a motion. Okay, yeah. Who is willing to move? Mr. I'll McNamee? provide the motion, Madam oh. Chair. Mr. Jones? Madam okay, Mayor, go I'm, ahead. Yes, I move the recommend, recommended action 10B. All right, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Angler? Gladly, yes. And uh, Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 5 0. Excellent. We now go to item 12, which is council issues and recommendations. There is nothing listed under council issues, but I would like to take this um, opportunity to report on a couple of events that I attended and um, that I found very emotional. I attended a celebration for our special education seniors graduating from various local high schools. This was organized by Special Education District Advisory Committee. They put on a virtual celebration uh, on a Friday evening. And I never thought that I would be on Zoom dancing in my chair to the music that they were playing, but here I was dancing. My, my kids thought I was crazy and were slightly embarrassed. But um, it was just wonderful to see the kids and the families. We were talking about a pandemic year, an online learning year, and the teachers put so much effort into this, uh, the aides, the caregivers, but for special ed kids to get through this year of online learning, that was just the best proof of resilience that I have ever seen. So 200 kids graduated from um, the various local high schools and are moving on to the next chapter in their lives. Uh, that one, that celebration was very touching. I also attended um, a leadership presentation by elementary school children at Conejo School Elementary School, uh, which is right off of uh, Tio Boulevard. And it was actually presented by the Open Classroom Magnet School. And these kids, this, this is a school with a high population, Hispanic students, Latino students. And it is the school where a lot of white families left. And these kids are just so amazing. They are so amazing. I was blown away and I was so happy that I was invited to attend that. Uh, we have little leaders in the making, bilingual leaders in the making, and being bilingual is so very important in this day and age. If you speak three languages, even better, but bilingual, I'll take that. So, um, and uh, then finally, I would like to just remind my council colleagues uh, from where we came. Mr. Adam and I have been on this council for a long time. I've been on this council longer than Mr. Adam, but 
we have worked very hard to have cohesion on the council and to be able to work with one another. It took a long time to achieve that, but we were able to achieve harmony on the council. And I'm just very emotional about this because I've worked very hard on this. I don't want any council member to put all of that, the hard work, at risk. We do not use the dais to attack elected officials from our partner agencies. No matter what our personal beliefs are, we simply, out of civility and decorum, don't do that. Now, what you want to say privately on your social media account is wonderful. You can do that for a speech. But remember that as a council member, we all have a bully pulpit, and what we say and write on social media carries a lot of weight. And if that power is abused to spread misinformation, I have to say something. I just want to remind everyone to please stick to the norms, stick to decorum and civility, and leave personal vendettas and misinformation at a minimum. I'm not entertaining any comments about that. I'd now like to move on to the city manager report. Uh, Madam Mayor, no, I, I wish to uh, make a comment because- Unless it's an apology, out, I don't think we need to I need to, hear. to um, just say that the First Amendment of the Constitution is freedom yes. of speech. And I wish uh, at my last comments, last session, was to address the issue of misinformation put out by the uh, County Supervisor's uh, office and interjecting yourself into city business. And when I pointed that out, that was all very accurate. Given the social media post that I found out later from uh, advice from others that that was inaccurate, I took that post down. Thank you. And I object to and I uh, question your wisdom on calling this out at a time of city council, but that's your option because that's your freedom of speech. I have, it's and I've exercised mine as so. Absolutely, And Mr. I appreciate you sharing and, and airing your grievance. I am. However, I am still allowed to do what I did, and I will do it again, but I do apologize for any inaccuracies, but on the other hand, it works the other way from the uh, council member Parks. And I'm disappointed that you brought this up at this meeting, as you can tell, but on the other hand, if you call it out, I will call you on it too as well. Correct. So with that, I will turn it back over to you for whatever you Thank want to do you. at the meeting. Thank you. You are a new council member, and I want to remind everyone there is decorum. You can say what you want. The information has to be accurate. I just want to remind everyone, because otherwise we need to work on new council norms. And with that, we will go to the city manager. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, our next uh, regularly scheduled city council meeting will be held on uh, the 22nd of June. Uh, we currently have uh, three public hearings, uh, Lighting Landscape Assessment District, uh, adoption of Urban Water Management Plan, and uh, an update to our mobile home rent stabilization ordinance, um, amendments to comply with state law. Um, we uh, also will have uh, an update from um, the City Council ad hoc um, uh, committee on homelessness. Um, that meeting's on the 22nd of June. Um, just to remind uh, the public and the council, we'll have one more meeting prior to the council summer recess. That will be on Tuesday, the 6th of July. Um, currently, we have two items on that agenda. The um, uh, daylight project, better known as the Timber School uh, site project uh, that will be going to the Planning Commission at their next meeting. Uh, and we'll also have a department report um, on our Hill Canyon uh, treatment plant. Uh, it's a follow-up from our council goal setting, uh, so we'll have a focused discussion on the Hill Canyon uh, wastewater plant. Uh, that concludes my update. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Powers. We do have a closed session. Uh, I don't believe we're going to be able to report anything out. Mr. Heher, correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Heher, why don't you uh, announce the uh, special, or not the special, but the uh, closed session? Thank you, Madam Mayor. The closed session tonight is a conference with real property negotiators. Property is at 2200 East Thousand Oaks Boulevard in Thousand Oaks. The negotiating on behalf of the city is Andrew Powers, the city manager. Myself, Patrick Heher, assistant city attorney. Gary Rogers, deputy city manager. And Jamie Boscarino, finance director. Negotiating on behalf of property owner is T.O. Lakes LLC. Under negotiation, price and terms, and this is done pursuant to government code section 54956.8. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, our council meeting is adjourned until 
June 22nd. Have a good evening.